Hello again, everybody, and welcome to episode 103 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John, and welcome to our podcast. Um, I had a nice little uh, note from someone, uh, and they're a member of DanJohnUniversity.com, and they said something interesting. They said, I don't use the workout generator. I thought, well, okay, that's fine. That's that's. And they said that they're on the site because of the download section. We have hundreds and hundreds of pages of articles uh, on the site, but we also have these downloads. And to be honest, I, I go through them sometimes and it's like some of the best work I've done in my career is in those downloads, but then you'll find stuff from uh, Tim Anderson and Pat Flynn, among many others, that have shared their their information and ideas with us. Um, my good friend Marty Gallagher shared with us his uh, powerlifting program, and I and I think it's absolutely amazing to read it. So, you know, I know it's always a bit difficult when someone is uh, trying to sell their site, but I mean, I think Brian and I have made the site so reasonable in expense, so reasonable in cost. And there's so much there. I'd, I would hope you at least take your time to look into it. So danjohnuniversity.com. Enjoy a, two, a free two-week uh, journey. And then uh, stay around. Um, the download area is amazing. The essays are great. The workout generator, the videos. And then, of course, the forum, which I think is just amazing. N not because of me. I think it's amazing because of the people. Uh, uh, you ask a question on the forum and you're going to get replies uh, from a lot of people, a lot of good people. Somebody asked me if they could just get a forum membership and I had to say no. And the reason is all you have to do is read the comments on YouTube, read the comments on, on any forum. People, especially anonymous, have become horrendous human beings. I'd like to say assholes, but you know, that's probably not something you want to hear coming out of my mouth, but that's the truth. You know, uh, these uh, internet warriors are not the kind of people I want on my site. The nice thing about the site is that it uh, it is self-moderated because, you know, the people sign up. And so we know, you know who they really are. And I don't mind, you know, certainly have, if you don't want to use your real name, that's fine. But if you say something that's inappropriate, that's ist of any kind, uh, we know who you are and... Uh, and we prefer you not act like that in our forum. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to hi hold back your free speech or anything, but there's a time and place for sp free speech, and there's a time and place to support people. And uh, I believe in both, and it's okay to have opposing concepts in your head. Let's get to our questions. Our first question today is from Daniel. What a lovely name. How do you teach people to lower the weight when doing repetition, barbell cleans, or snatches in the cases where you do not want to drop to the floor? Well, that's that's interesting because then I'll go to these modern gyms, especially some of these uh, workout that shall not be named sites that I believe they call their work gyms boxes because, you know, gyms just not cool enough. Um, and they drop every lift. I mean, if they've got... 30 kilos on the bar they drop it like it's a world record and if you have the bumper plates and stuff that's fine the amount of damage over time though it really does do a lot i grew up when we had iron plates and if you drop the weight a lot in warm-ups there would be no platform and you would have your neighbors would come over and complain and let me tell you one thing my mom would complain and you uh, she scares me now when she's been gone for 41 years um, the way I always lowered it was the way Dick taught us. Um, basically, um, Dick Notmeyer's approach. So in the clean and jerk, you bring it to the chest and then you slough it off. You kind of catch it at mid thigh and you bring it gently to the floor. That's how you lowered the weight in the clean and jerk. But in the snatch, the way we did it was this. At the finish of the snatch, we kind of shrug, caught it down here, down here to the floor. So, um... It was kind of cool at the time to watch guys like David Rieger, the great Soviet uh, middleweight, basically, lifter. Middle heavy, I should say, 198 lifter, mostly in his career. Watching him bring down world records and then just gently put it on the floor. I love that, you know, because it showed such a mastery of the weight. 
Um, somebody told me at the last weightlifting meet that they have new rules in Olympic lifting that you actually have to you actually have to drop the bar now, which I think is just stupid. And I guess you can't you put your foot on the bar, and it's like whatever, you know. I, I I'm fine, but that's how I do it, Daniel. And you know, I think there's value in learning to lower the bar quietly. Um, you can call it eccentric training, but I just think it a it keeps your family and friends and neighbors happier. And B, um, it's just so much easier on the equipment. But, you know, your mileage may vary, as we sometimes say online. I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a question from Pete. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we've had this question before, Pete. So we might have to say this is a, a repeat. <laughs> How would you train the bench press if you only had access to it once per week? My situation. Pete, that... There's nothing, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with benching once a week. In fact, of all the lifts, I think the deadlift and the bench press, well, it's tough, but uh, I would, there's about a thousand options. I, if you do something like one lift a day where you're just benching once a week and the day you bench is the day you bench, I have no issue with you going in and, uh, you know, doing like a um, one of those more, they're, they're a lot sexier than the workouts I do, but it's it's the idea where you 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 go in, you know, you do your warm-ups, you add weight, you add weight, you add weight, you know, and as you're adding weight, it's a ramp, but I know it's not the, the best way to lift weights. But you try to go and see, you know, get a sense of how strong you are today, and then you do the back offsets for your workout. So you peak up to kind of sort of kind of test your weekly max. Um, I wouldn't want you to max seriously max 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 every week but get a sense to see how the load's going drop down and get your workout in. and that be five sets of five or three sets of three so you have two workouts in one so you have the ramp up to that tested uh um daily max from there you make a decision to do five sets of five or three sets of three and in this case i would stick with a single weight uh on those because you've already done this already uh, so you're already ramping it naturally. Three sets of eight is also a good workout. Um, well, there's that's not a, there's a um, you could do something as simple as this. Uh, week one, three sets of five. Week two, three sets of five. Week one, week two, five sets of three. So a little bit heavier, but the reps, uh, you know, be a little bit easier to get to them. Uh, week three have a really high volume day that would be the five sets of five striving maybe even to to find a place uh, but uh, maybe the week two loads are close to the week two loads and then on week four might be a good day to go go try for a heavy double do a set of five so you would go to that early max in the workout and then come back and do a set of five a set of three and then test the double so you'd have two two ascensions and then after that walk away um since you're just doing it once a week i would suggest one other day to do some uh perfect push-ups that's where you uh you do a push-up as you come down you hit your chest put your hands off to the side in a t bring them back and do push up another one you might only have to do that once a week but twice would be okay too and then strive one day to get as many as you can in a minute and the other day just pick a number like i'm going to do a total of a hundred or fifty or I don't know, I don't care what the number is. And then just so if it takes you ten sets of ten to get there, five if five sets of ten, whatever whatever number is, and just get yourself up to those numbers. Just to keep those because there is a specific soreness you get in bench pressing. And the only way I've ever seen of getting around it, um, interesting, I had a massage last night and I haven't benched in years, but I'm still always hyper sore right in that little valley right there where it just seems to be where all the soreness seems to just all find its happy place. I hope that helps, Pete. Uh, let me know what you decide and get back to me if this works. Thank you. We have a question from Robin. How would you train for a police military run test? I need to run 3K in 12 minutes, and I'm currently... At about 2.5k. Oh, so you're you're a full 500 meters from the goal. 3k in 12 minutes. 
that's uh you know that's that's really one of the uh, one of the better standards I've seen in a while. That's actually pretty interesting. Okay, a couple things, Robin. First, um, I think you need a run at least once a week of about nine to ten k. Uh, we have found in my at least in my work, uh, you need at least one day a week where you get that long slow distance in, and I think that by itself might help you. Uh, but then. Um, you know, we're looking at the 3K, so 3,000. Uh, you're going to obviously have to run probably uh, three to four times a week. Okay, so you're going to have that one large gar garbage run. You know, I do like the idea, by the way, and it, this may or may not work for you, but if you can find those uh, bagel 10Ks, you know, I, don't, I, I call them bagel 10Ks because everyone eats bagels at them. If you don't have bagels, I guess you go to prison or hell or something. But, you know, there are those... I don't know, the fun runs, the fundraiser runs, they're usually five or 10 K. And if you went every Saturday or just had your friends and you met up and you did this organized 10 K, I can guarantee Robin, your numbers would come down because when someone passes you, you would say to yourself, someone just passed me and you stick with them and it'd make you run faster. One day a week, I think you need to do some kind of speed work, um, just to get your, your time. And speed work doesn't have to be 100 meters for you. It can be something as simply as, uh, well, uh, I, boy, if you start running 400 meters, you're going to hate my guts. But some kind of thing where you're going fast. Now, 100 meters is too short for this particular test. Uh, obviously, doing 800 and 1600 uh, loops is going to be tough. But pick a day where you consciously try to go fast faster than you do on your race day i would so long slow distance day the the bagel run a speed day where you're actually practicing your running you're practicing going faster it could be broken up into something as simple as a, a 100 a 200 a 400 a 200 a 100 and really try to go fast on those that's not a bad workout the other two days a week i think you need to do i, I don't mind the idea of one day a week, you you run the three k and you don't judge it. Uh, in fact, I don't look at splits. Um, get a sense of where your breathing is, um, and just run the three thousand the, the three thousand meters. Um, you know I, what I'd like you to do is try to get your your easy three thousand meter is to finish it and go. Okay, I got plenty left in the tank. What was my time? Oh, it took me fourteen minutes. Well. You know, the next three weeks later, that was easy, and it's 12 minutes, 30 seconds. The fourth day is the day I want you to think about the most. Um, this would be the day I'd want you to get on a heart rate monitor, and I want you to do the Maffetone number. One, don't go above 180 minus your age. So if you're 20, let's say you're 30, so don't go over 150, and I want you to run in that with your heart rate 130 to 150. And I'd like it to be, so it'd be nice if you had a good heart rate monitor where you stayed in there. And I'd like to see, see how long you can stay in that zone comfortably. Uh, many people call that a talk test. This would be a good day to go out with someone at your same uh, running capability or a better runner who doesn't who wants to have an easy day. So there you go. Uh, a speed day, uh, a heart rate monitor day, a long, slow distance day, and then, of course, the day one day a week you practice the three thousand, uh, the three thousand meters, um, the three k, and uh, just get used to running that distance. Uh, I hope that helps. Um, runners run, man, and so that's what you're going to have to do. Thank you. Steve says this. I was wondering if any of your training philosophies have changed over the years. Well, oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I'm amazed sometimes when people bring up something that I wrote and it'd be like, yeah, that's just, that's just stupid. I mean, I was, you know, I mean, I, I bought in fully to the workout that shall not be named. I bought in fully to uh, the four minute Tabata idea, which is still, by the way, still has value. Just, you know, about once or twice a month at most, probably once a month for most people. Um, Boy, there's so many. Um, 
supplements almost entirely I don't see any value in anymore which is too bad because I think supplements have a place I just think that uh, it's it's more important to make sure you get your vegetables and your your sleep in than it is to take a pill um, there's a lot of supplements I regret re recommending um, you know um, eating eating uh, a good salad is, is better probably than most supplements. Oh boy. Um, I, I think I used to push, uh, load and going heavy too much. And I've brought, I've come back on that. Um, I have, I think I have a better vision of the role of diet and exercise to the lifetime. Now, uh, I think you've got up until about age 35 for an untrained, whatever, whatever you want to call that 35 to 40 ish age group, you got to lock down uh, nutrition up to about 35 or 40 before we talk about exercise that, you know, if you're not eating vegetables, if you don't know, if you don't have the ability to fast between, I didn't say 16 hour fast. I said not, you know, basically don't nibble constantly. Um, and then once you hit 35, 40, then actually it becomes more important when you first work with someone to get into the habit of exercise past 35 to 40, whatever that number is. I'm not sure going for a daily walk is getting the habit of a daily walk, the habit of going and getting your strength workout in the habit of you know, all the other habits, all the good habits, uh, at first might be more important than getting in your, uh, your, your dietary tweaks. Uh, and that is a truth about aging is that you, you, you can't have three hard workouts a week and, you know, lump around the other four. You have to do something every day as you age. And that becomes truer and truer and truer. I think one of the things that's helped me the most, Steve, um, is I have been doing this since 1965. I have my journals, you know, let's reach back and grab a couple of them. You know, I got my journals, um, all the way back to 1970, 71. So I can check check in on my own BS constantly, which really seems to help me a lot. Um, you know, it's hard when the numbers are looking you in the eye. Um, you know, I don't lie to you people about my best lifts. I don't lie to you about my stories. And you can come in and look at my journals and tell me if I'm full of crap or not. So for me, um, I've made a lot of mistakes, but then I was with somebody the other day here and I brought out my 2000 journal and I started to laugh because it says there, uh, think it's, I always start off a journal with uh, a series, a list of things called things I know. <laughs> that sounds weird, but it's what I believe at the time when I write, when I start the new journal and it's a simple thing. It takes seconds usually because it's so clear. And in the 2000 one, it says push, pull, squat. Those are what you need to do, but you need to do them in balance. Well, it took me another 15 or 16 years to clarify that into my movement matrix but it's there in 2000 it's just not as clear as i want it to be so that's kind of interesting yeah that's a good question steve and i'm going to uh um i'll think about that and i'll see if i can come up with some more for you okay thank you great question we have a question from chris deep squats under load after total hip replacement and i see there's an exclamation point Aren't you sometimes afraid of your hip popping out? Then he answers a good question. Then he gets to the point. Seven months after my operation, I'm still insecure. Yeah, Chris, six months after the operation, my total hip replacement, my second one. And by the way, gentle listener, for the thousandth time, it wasn't my lifting that got me a double hip replacement. It's my birth. I have a genetic issue called pistol grip hips. Uh, according to my doctor, I am the poster boy for it. The day I was born, I was destined to a double hip replacement. Um, I have blue eyes, folks. Okay? That's just the way it is. I'm not going to... That's the way I was born. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do five sets of two and they're going to turn brown. Um, six months after, I wasn't square. I was doing six-point rocks and easy goblet squats. But uh, every single surgeon I work with says what, I, what I'm doing is right. Uh, I'm building up the muscles around the joint so that it'll stick together. And in your case, uh, Chris, seven months after, it's okay to still feel insecure 
man, it is, it's a, folks, joint replacements, for those of you who haven't had them, it's a, it's a scary thing. I mean, they are, okay, this shouldn't be a shock. They are replacing a joint. They are putting metal and plastic inside of you. And sometimes it doesn't work. And in the past, the plastic corroded way faster. This is some scary stuff. Some scary poopy. So yeah. Um, keep going. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. Get your walks in. Get your six point rocks in. Um, and then maybe maybe down the road, Chris, you'll you'll be where I'm at, okay? Thank you. We have a question from Marco Polo. I noticed that when I do low rep squats, deadlifts, and loaded carries for a few months, I gain some volume in my belly. My gut increases, and I believe that this is not fat. Okay, we have to be careful in this one because I agree with your next statement, but I also we also have to be a little honest. In your book, Never Let Go, you mentioned that you had the same issue when you did a lot of low rep heavy squats. So, yeah, I mean, this sounds like... <laughs> There's a great, uh, I think the show was Frasier, where the three of them all have this, the, the cleaner keeps uh, shrinking my pants. She said she'd call, and, the, and Niall has something else. Uh, yes, <laughs> squats make my belly grow. It's not the beer and pizza. Okay, so let's dismiss that. There is some stomach distension that happens when you do heavy squats, uh, the heavy deadlift thing, I can see that happen. You're the first to mention loaded carries on this. But anytime your body is asked to exert that anaconda strength, um, there can be a tendency for the belly to kind of distort a little bit. Now, that can probably be addressed early by doing things like suitcase carries and doing things um, that build up that, uh, that, that X, you know, the right shoulder, left hip, left shoulder, right hip to build up that whole system. And that can be my knock sometimes on doing the power lifts. Um, well, I also know it can be caused by drugs. There's a guy up at the, this amusement park near my house, Lagoon, and he showed up strutting around with all his veins popping out of his pecs and stuff. And his belly was probably, if his chest was this wide, his belly was this wide. And I don't, I, I don't think he's seen a side mirror in a while. Um, I would say, I would say you're going to have to look really closely at what you want in your goals. Uh, I do know this, that when I Olympic lift and do loaded carries, I don't get it. When I power lift, I do historically so it could be the nature of how you're countering the load um so uh, it's an interesting question i feel right now right now like i'm just making stuff up but i'm not comfortable with that but i've seen it you've seen it others have mentioned it too um it might be why i think the front squat is superior to the back squat for making people look good and feel good. We could be on the same path here. Um, Marco, this is a good question. Um, and it deserves a follow-up uh, and any any more insights that we can get. Intelligent insights, okay? Thank you, Marco. That's, that's a solid question. We have a question from Auntie or Auntie. If someone prefers a... If someone prefers a pull hinge pattern... Should he, she do more exercises that are not natural, press squat, or should focus on what they are doing well and more naturally? So Auntie is talking about a concept I have where I have a little quadrant where I have push-pull on the top and hinge squat on the sides. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm a, I am a push-hinger. I mean, I mean, I, I was a great deadlifter the first time I deadlifted. I've only deadlifted heavy three or four times in my whole life. Um... I can press, press, press all day long. Pull-ups and squats are not natural for me. What, what I'm starting to think, Auntie, on this is this, is that so to, for performance, I want you to focus on the things you're good at and you have here is pull and hinge. 
So when you're getting to compete or, you know, whatever, those are the two you're, you're going to focus on. But the other two are good for your hypertrophy and overall body balance. I feel like for me, it's, it's almost a blessing as an athlete because the sports I picked, you know, the big push and the big hinge are what we're doing. Whereas the pull and the squat, for me, did the hypertrophy work. So don't get yourself into an either or on this. I don't think you did. But what, what you might want to do is say to yourself, okay, the, the, the pull and the hinge are going to propel me ahead in my sports. The other two are going to keep me tied together and feeling good and moving good. So both have value. Make one the athletic, the athletic kind of training and make the other one the more hypertrophy balance kind of training. And just so you know, um, this is all fairly new-ish to me. So you have to realize that my answers on this aren't as clear as they'll be uh, 50 years from now. Okay, thank you. Good question. I have a question from Mike. Mike says this, at your age, I am the same age as you. Good for you. Am I still able to build muscle am, or am I lucky to just maintain? Boy, you know, I'm going to stop right there, Mike, because that's a good thing. That's why the great strength researchers would always say, get yourself as strong as you could in your youth because, you know, um, as we age, strength levels drop. And the idea was this. If you came into old age really, really strong, you would be even late in your life, in your 90s, still not even where an average 50-year-old might be, okay? So that is like the fountain of youth on the strength side. In hypertrophy, I mean, the smartest thing, everyone got mad at Art Devaney for saying this, but when the woman asked, what's the best way to lose fat? And he said, don't get fat in the first place. I mean, that upset a lot of people, but he was right. So if you can go into your, po and I think that the age is about 30, you know, if you can get to your 30s without being, you know, setting the foundation for obesity, you're going to be so much happier in your 60s like we are than if you did not. Now, building lean body mass after, well, probably, what is it, about 35 to about 55 is where a lot of the engines really start to slow down for hypertrophy. So you want to get into your mid-30s with the best, the best level of reasonable but continually attainable lean body mass that you can have. Got to be reasonable, but it has to be continually attainable. So, I mean, I mean, it'd be that walking around lean body mass that you can, if if you go on a two two year thing, that's you know, and you know, I don't know, get deployed somewhere, or change jobs, or have to raise two new you know newborn twins or something like that. That the weight you weigh two years later, the lean body mass there, that's the lean body mass I think I'm talking about here. Um, can you, now, the okay, so when you get in that 35 to 55 range as, it, as it's, you start to drop down in lean body mass, uh, you get fatter and you lose your, your, your muscle, you, you know, I, it's easier to maintain that than to try to build it. Now, once you get to our age, can you still build lean body mass? I think you can, but you have to be doing things um, across the board that support it. And I'm not talking about going to a doctor and getting injections or something like that. I'm talking about your sleep. Uh, uh, I, I meditate now almost daily now for at least 15 minutes. Um, I think... I think it helps my sleep for one thing, but I also think it helps it, it, how it helps lean body mass. I don't know, but boy, you can sure see it on me. Um, I have found that lifting weights, uh, Olympic lifting and walking, lifting weights for me, Olympic lifting and walking, that seems to do more for me to get lean body mass up than training harder because, you know, let's just say when you're, when you're 14, you have this much range to screw things up 
at our age, you have this much range to screw things up. So if you're overtraining in the weight room, you can't fix it with sleep. If you're killing yourself in your cardio, you can't fix it with your vegetables and protein. So you just have to do enough to keep sparking the system up. But yes, I do think you can. It's not going to be like when you hit puberty. For me, it was nice. In college, I finally hit puberty. It was nice. Thank you, God. Um, my goal, Mike says, is good health and strength well into my 80s and beyond. Okay. Sleep. Get those meditations in. Practice falling, you know. Okay, sleep, meditation, some kind of recovery. I have a sauna right behind me. Right through that door is a sauna. Um, uh, I guess ice baths are good for some people. I think they're too cold. Um, get your vegetables in, get your protein in, um, lift weights, but don't burn the candle at both ends. Uh, get your walks in, get your light rucking, your heavy hands, whatever it is, get your body fat burned down, do that. But try to nudge everything into the right direction. That's the fact. That's a great phrase for us. I want you to nudge your strength levels up. I want you to nudge your fat loss burners faster. I want you to nudge your cardiovascular conditioning. I want you to nudge your sleep in a more positive direction. I don't want you to come down and hammer on it because you're just not going to be able to do it. But if you can do 365, 366 days a year of better sleep, better vegetables, better protein, smarter cardio, smarter weight training, You'll get to where you need to be in your 80s, you know, if, if, if everything else works out too. I hope that helps. Good question. Alejandro writes us, what is your prediction of fitness and strength and conditioning in the future? I think it's going to get stupider and stupider and stupider. And reasonable voices are going to get drowned out by the Instagram overnight millionaires and the bimbos and the plastic surgeries and the outright fraud and lying. Absolutely no difference, in other words, than what we've had the last 50 years. Um, I, think, I think it's nice to see with kettlebells coming back, with programs like Easy Strength, people starting to listen again to, okay, let, let's quit talking about bodybuilding constantly. Let's talk about getting strong. Um, a guy like Tim Anderson, instead of talking about all this, let's just get, you know, let's just move, move better, feel better. If like his great line, it feels good to feel good. So that's, that's what I want you to do, but I'm not pretty enough to, to sell, <laughs> you know, those, remember those ads they had on Sunday morning about and Everybody was so enthusiastic about the program. Jeepers, I did this. And they, they hire these models to say they did, did the program. And we all now know they lied. Okay, but it's the follow-up I want you to know. Do you think that individual sessions will slowly become rare and most of the work will be done online? Online, uh, it's kind of already happened because of COVID. But I think uh, a personal trainer who just does individual sessions, and this comes right from my good friend Tom Plummer, I think you're crazy. How many hours in a day can you, even if you charge $1,000 an hour, I mean, <laughs> that means if you want to increase, it means you have to add more hours to your day. And that's just crazy. Uh, I always thought group sessions were better. Uh, I, I love training in groups. I train one-on-one -on -one sometimes. I've done it as a coach. I, and it's fine. It's, you know, like if we're out throwing the discus or something like that, that's one thing, but what you'll notice is that when you do things in a group setting, that everybody learns from everybody. So you have, if you have 40 athletes in the room at once, you have 40 people learning from the mistakes of the other 39. And that's, that's what I think. Will we be on totally online? Uh, there's a downside to it. I mean, I, I see these new, those massive mirrors and TV sets that you put up on a wall with the equipment in there. My God. We know that the average use of a treadmill is 7.2 times. No one uses them. We know that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a piece of electronics that's huge, that's got the equipment stored in it. It's electronic. It's electronic. It's electronic. I just don't see how that's going to work uh, very long. So 
fitness online. Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of it will be there. And then uh, in group settings, of course, as you know, um, I'm a huge believer in something called an intentional community. And for me, that's been my hope for a long time that people will gather together. Uh, interesting, as I'm saying this, I just spent the last three days, probably probably average five to 12 hours a day helping my neighbors. We had a massive, bizarre tornado, windstorm, something hit our neighborhood. Um, some of the houses in my neighborhood, as I'm talking right now, are uninhabitable because of trees. We lost power for a long time. Um, so I've just spent the last couple days with my neighbors cleaning up each other's yards and taking things to the green waste dump we have here in beautiful Murray, Utah and uh, shoveling and uh, raking and chopping and sawing and carrying. And we all did it. I think we clean up our neighborhood probably 15 times faster than the professionals could because it's an intentional community. We all came together to help each other. And I think uh, for your fitness and health goals, coming together with people who have the same concepts is a better way to go. That's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. We have a question from Anthony. Anthony says this, I am curious on your thoughts about using supplemental movements as primary lifts. That is, paw squat, Romanian deadlift, incline bench, for a training block. Before we can get going, Anthony, of course I love it. Any, I mean, you, uh, the basic, well, probably the basic thing I use, I mean, variation in a variation of Dan John program very often is just simply, um, you know, you go from bench press to incline bench. You go from incline bench to military press. You go from in, in military press to decline. You go from gobble squat to front squat to back squat. That, that to me is what, yeah, I love this idea. Sometimes I get burned out on the primary movements. Hello, everyone does. How long would you run something like this and are variations a viable way to get about getting stronger long term? Yes, 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 yes. I'm a little disappointed with you, Anthony, because that question is, to me, very obvious. But just because it's obvious to me doesn't mean it's a stupid question. Uh, it's the You just said the way I train people. I like, I mean, the perfect program, there's no variation. You know, um, the, it's the joke I usually make about, I, I read one time that Purina monkey chow was all a human needed for, uh, for, for diet. And then one of my friends, her name is Sam. She said, well, actually they had to change the formula because it was giving diabetes to monkeys or something like that. So there, there's your caveat. But I'm sure there could be a Purina monkey chow and I could make you eat. So drink Purina monkey chow, uh, eat Purina monkey chow, drink water, and then I'm going to give you a workout that you have to do every day for the next 20 years. Well, I think you'd, I think you'd hang yourself by bending a, a barbell around your neck because that would be so boring. Humans love variation. We're not you know, we're not carnivores. I mean, yes, I know a book came out called The Carnivore Diet and someone said that, you know, that's proof that the carnivore diet is correct. The fact that a book came out means that it proves something. <sighs> and I'm, there's vegans and vegetarians, but, you know, humans are omnivores. We can shovel anything down our mouth. And I think it really helps us to be omnivores. I like to eat seasonally. I, I'm a big believer in that. And I think we're omnivores when it comes to the weight room too. Thank you. We have a question from Paul. I'm a 52-year-old lifetime athlete lifter. My low back is randomly but regularly going out when I deadlift. I'm trying not to set any records in regards to weight, and I'm also a stickler for form. A good example would be three weeks ago I pulled... 265 for a triple without any issue, yet today my back went out on my first work set of 185 with his body weight. This, the fourth time in two years this has happened at relatively low load. Is it time to just admit defeat to father time and stop doing deads? Or do you have any advice or recommendations? You know, you could, Paul, just be built that deadlifting off the floor with a strict 
standard barbell isn't for you. I mean, have you tried rack deadlifts? Have you tried snatch grit deadlifts? Duck deadlifts? That's where your, your heels are together. Um, no, I, I would say this. You, you give me no information about height or anything like that. But 52-year-old, uh, 185, that's real good. Those two numbers are real good to me and, and good for you. But maybe it's the variation. It could be something as simple as you're too tall for the barbell and you just need to lift it up. I, I like I, I do not like people doing deadlifts after, and you're way over that age, about 35, um, unless it's a competition. Uh, I like the, the bar to be about one inch below the knee, so right on the patella tendon, or just like one inch above the knee where the, uh, you know, the, the horseshoe muscles uh, are on, on the knee. Um, yeah, I, that could, it could be that simple. Um, it'd be interesting to see where your back goes out. Um, I would also make sure I got, get a, get a video or get a picture if you can of your hips and maybe even your lower back. Because there might be something, you know, relatively egregious uh in those areas that needs you that need you to look at a little closer uh i don't know what medical intervention you've done for these but four times in two years you you need you need a good hands-on person to look and touch and figure this out it could be the smallest thing too you know you you know you go up to Stu mcgill and Stu mcgill might just say suitcase carries or, or just go for more walks i don't know but that's a lot of injuries in a in a, in a couple year period thank you paul uh get back to me we have a question from mike mike says this i'm getting back into distance running after being away from it for several years and focusing on strength training more specifically i'd like to move back into some distance running but i want to continue to strength train an easy strength 10 to 15 minute session sounds perfect. Here's my question. Would it be better to do the 10, 15 minute easy strength session before or after a training run? Okay. My experience says you do the strength and then you go for your run. That's my experience. Uh, we know that the, the lifting frees up free fatty acids as I've been told, and then you'd burn them on your run. Um, and the other thing too is that then on the run, if you do find a hill and you want to attack this hill as hard as you can, it won't impact the strength training after. So remember, you're in the weight room trying to get strong. You're out running to get better as a runner. Um, I would say lift first. In the tradition in track and field, we've attempted both, and I'm not sure which one's better, but I'm starting to think that lift, then run. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Daniel. Gosh, two Daniels, one episode. That's exciting. I'm wondering about how often to lift when working manual labor. On the bright side, I definitely get in the five essential movements daily. But manual labor doesn't directly improve lifts. And it's interesting. Now watch this. Do you recommend focusing on a weekend workout once a week like Marty Gallagher has written about. How about I keep from crashing right before the work week? How would I keep, I'm sorry, how would I keep from crashing right before the work week? Should I do something like easy strength just once a week? No. Or should I focus on easy strength program but make the weights extremely light? Well, if you're going to lift every day and you decide to do easy strength, um, yeah, I mean, I would come home from work, uh, push, pull hinge uh, do some goblet squats in the warm-up and then do like mobility after and that's it uh, you've already done all the work all day you don't need more if you decide to go to marty's uh one day a week thing uh i would find a community that will will support you on it you're going to go in and you're going to do you know you're going you're to squat bench deadlift you're going to stick to very strict numbers um, it seems to work. And with your, with your manual labor, this might be a real, real good idea. Um, I like it. Um, so easy strength, yeah, five days a week, go light, 
just do the, I mean, goblet squat in the warm up, push pull hinge, and you're done. So those are going to be fast workouts. Or do the one workout a day where you do, you know, eights for th four weeks. Uh, DanJohnUniversity.com. Go into the downloads, read Marty's program, and he's got some stuff in there that might help you. If you can, I'd love it if you do have a nightly walk, like maybe for dinner, just for health and the general tonic of your body. These are the tough questions. Um, these are the tough ones because, you know, I don't, I don't want to mess with your job. I don't want to mess with your life. But I do want to help you with, with, with a full life. So um, you have a lot of options. I'd love to see you try the Marty Gallagher thing for 12 weeks. You know, basically a month of eights, a month of fives, and then three, two, 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 and then test it out. Try that. And then try the easy strength for 12 weeks and see which one you like better. Um, by the way, you know what you'll probably find? Both work really well and back to back work even better. So thank you. Wow, that's it. That's it. That's that's episode 103. We're, we're finished. Remember now, if you want to support us, uh, you can go to Patreon, Coach Dan John, sign up. You'll get all the videos. Or the easiest way, of course, is to go to danjohnuniversity.com, sign up. Uh, don't forget we have the downloads and we have the essays. And we have the great form of the workout generator. You've got all those darn programs in there that are just, that you just uh, click buttons and you're going to love them. So. Thank you, um, and until next time, you know, keep on lifting and learning. Bye-bye.